So we've been talking for uh, weeks about this new OpenAI video generation tool called Sora. Mm -hmm. This is something that was demoed. Sam Aldman uh, was sort of fielding requests on X for you know people. Sh you know, tell me whatever prompt you want to type into Sora, and I'll, uh, I'll I'll see what comes out of it. This is basically doing for video what tools like Dolly and Midjourney did for still images. It works much the same way. It's one of these diffusion-based models. You type in some text, it gives you back. Uh, a, a, a snippet of video representing whatever you typed. Yeah, and you hear that and you think, well, you know, we, we know that making films is extraordinarily expensive. It's very collaborative. It involves all kinds of specialists. And the idea that we might soon be in a world where people can just type what kind of movie they want to see in a box and get something resembling that feels like a big leap forward. So whenever any new AI tool uh, comes out, my first question is always, well, can I use it? And for this uh, tool, Sora, the answer was absolutely Absolutely not. That's um, right. The, the people who weren't allowed to use this product, they called the Sora losers. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we couldn't actually use this tool ourselves. OpenAI is not making this public yet for various reasons, but they did put out a uh, blog post sort of showcasing the work of a bunch of filmmakers who were given access to the earliest versions of Sora. And so we are going to do the next best thing today, which is we are going to talk to someone who has actually been able to uh, use Sora and play around with it. So today we are talking with Paul Trillo. Um, he is uh, part of this uh, gr small group of artists and filmmakers who were given access, and he is a multidisciplinary artist and filmmaker who is based in L.A. Uh, I've seen some of his work before with other AI tools. He's been playing around with this stuff for a while now, um, and we're going to talk to him today about what he learned, uh, what his experience was like, and what he thinks the implications for Hollywood and some of the filmmakers out there who are nervous about this stuff are. That's right. And one of the things we're going to ask him about is this short film that he made with Sora called The Golden Record, which he made after being inspired by a project that Carl Sagan undertook in the 1970s to create a kind of audio time capsule of humanity and broadcast it out into space in the hopes that aliens would find it and listen to it and decide not to destroy our entire civilization <laughs> which so far let's say it it's been successful it worked the yep. golden record worked hats off to carl so let's bring in paul paul trillo welcome to hard fork oh wow thank you so much for having me this is literally the only podcast i can tolerate these days <laughs> so you're like the shock you're like the shock jocks of tech and it's just um, we, we actually yeah, were recently know. voted the most tolerable podcast which was um, <laughs> it's a big honor for us yeah very yeah. few people have told us they uh mm -hmm. they they've they've you know punched their speakers after hearing the podcast <laughs> yeah um so paul i'm wondering if you could tell us about the emotional experience of using sora you know the first time you typed in some keywords uh, typed in a prompt into this tool and got back a video did it yeah did you feel anything i mean i i was shocked i was floored i was confused I, wa I was like a little bit unsettled because I was like, damn, this is like doing things that I didn't know it was capable of. Do you remember what the, the first thing you tried was that you that you had that reaction with? The, the first one that really took me out of it was the video that the, it's the first 15 seconds that appears in the OpenAI blog post of this kind of reel I did where I'm zooming through time and I'm 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 saying all right, give me this like dynamic, fast moving time lapse from like volcanic, volcanic ash going underwater. And then we emerge into like ancient civilizations and we are zooming through like the 1700s, 1800s, uh, and then into like modern day time and um, throwing all this stuff at it. And it gave me something that looked like it was shot on Super 8 film. It was like zooming, um, it was moving the camera in a way that was never possible with like old film technology and it was like making edits within the clip. So it was, it almost had its own sense of pacing and editing. Mm. And it, that really made me think, oh, okay, once you kind of throw a lot like the kitchen sink at this thing and you get this really experimental effect, you can start to experiment in ways uh, that we've never experimented with before. And so that, that really got me excited was, was specifically that mm. kind of hallucinatory aspect very cool can you just walk us through the basic steps of the process of making a film using a tool like sora like what prompts yeah. did you use for this film like how long did it take you to put it all together just walk us through the process a little bit 
there's a text field. There's a website that you go to and there's a text field. Um, you prompt like, you know, you're used to prompting with other generative AI tools. And then it gets sort of translated, interpreted through ChatGPT. So it's like, oh, okay, you want this. And then it gives you something like that. And then you can edit the ChatGPT response. But the process of using Sora, I feel like is akin to trying to tell a story to a toddler with superpowers. Mm. Uh, what do you mean? It feels, a, it feels a little bit like, yeah, like this um, naive entity with black magic superpowers. I want to just uh, root this conversation in an actual in the actual video that you produced with Sora or one of the videos that you've produced with Sora, I, I think we should just like watch it together and uh, we'll kind of describe what we're seeing and then we're going to ask you some questions about it. Okay. It's very chaotic and kinetic and dynamic cool. and may cause motion sickness, but uh, <laughs> that was kind of the Do we have the, to sign a point. waiver before watching this video? <laughs> yes. Yes, please. Uh, that was sort of the, the point though, was to, um, because the other video models, um, kind of function on like taking a frame and then guessing what the next frame is going to be, guessing what the next frame is going to be. Um, it creates these very kind of slow motion and sort of like uh, smudgy videos that you kind of see online where it's just like, you know, hair moving and slow kind of camera pushes in and, and not really what like filmmaking is all the time. And so my kind of test or, or way to like try to jailbreak Sora was like, I was just going to throw a ton of crazy prompts at it and, and just see what it gives me and see how it interprets it. The video that we're looking at right now is called The Golden oh. Record. And um, for people who, who aren't watching this on video, it's basically showing a, a vinyl record made of gold that is sort of hurtling through space. Yeah, I'm getting a yeah. little dizzy. <laughs> oh, and now we've got a spaceship. It's the Voyager 2, supposedly according to Sora. So yeah, the, the, the kind of test here was to see how, how dynamic can I make these camera moves? How cinematic can I create uh, an aesthetic that feels maybe different than what I had been seeing? Mm -hmm. So that's, that's <clears throat> a, a clip about a minute long. This is not a full feature film, but you, you did make this you know, almost entirely with Sora. Um, what was the idea there? Sure. Yeah, so I had been fascinated by this project kind of spearheaded by Carl Sagan and NASA like in 1976 and 77 uh, where they essentially made like a time capsule of, of humanity up until that point they collected sounds from like bubbling mud to like human speech and then they collected a bunch of songs uh, from around the world including like Johnny B Good is on the record and then they they encoded um, images into a uh, golden record um, and blasted out to, to um, space in hopes that maybe aliens someday. Well, it was literally, it was, it was a message sent to aliens. You know, we've talked about sending uh, episodes of Hard Fork out into space as a warning to <laughs> other alien civilizations. <laughs> <laughs> so can I ask some questions about the creative process here? So how many yeah. prompts did you use to make this one minute movie? Yeah, I... Probably five, okay. but there's like variations of that, right? Mm. So when I first got my hands on Sora, I was like, how do I break this thing? How do I <laughs> unstick it from this like very AI looking video aesthetic, um, these kind of slow moving camera moves, these things that feel like just 3D animation or stock footage. And so I was like, I need to like move the camera. And, and even if it causes motion sickness, that was part of the test was to see like how crazy can, can this get? How chaotic can it be? And just for the sake of comparison, how long would it have taken you to make something like the golden record using conventional film tools? And then how long did it take you using Sora? Yeah. I, I would say with all the, how dynamic the camera is, how maybe complex the renders are with, with dynamics, uh, with, you know, the materials being used, how many shots there are. I'd say this would take a, a, a few months to make. I did the golden record maybe in two or three days. 
Mm. So yeah, it's huge time crunch. Did OpenAI put any restrictions on Sora when you were using it? Like, did they tell you 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 can't make this kind of video or you got to stay away from this kind of prompt? Did they give you any guidance or did they just sort of they, give you access to this tool and and say go nuts? They specifically wanted to be like as hands off as possible, but it was obviously you know like no like nudity, no extreme. Yeah, gore. So there go all of Kevin's of ideas for making a movie with Sora. <laughs> yeah, I know. I see your eyes shifting, Kevin. You're, like, you're, you're deflating. <laughs> so, uh, Paul, as you as you reflect on the experience of making the the short films that you have made with Sora, would you say that on the whole the process felt easier than you expected, more difficult than you expected? Like, 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 where, where were your expectations for what this thing was going to be like, and and where did the the result fall? Yeah, I mean, I. I actually had somewhat like tempered expectations. I was just like, this is, you know, a cool tech demo that I saw from like a, a massive company with tons of compute power. Um, but is this applicable to filmmaking? And after kind of breaking it and loosening up the camera, I was like, oh, okay, this can give us some like experimental, you know, wild, bold, weird things that, that may be difficult uh, to achieve with other tools. And, and so that, so when I kind of cracked a, a series of, of words, it's basically kind of like alchemy with, with words. Then I was like, okay, this can like, this can allow for shot types that, and ideas that maybe get killed in the process of filming. Wait, what are some of the secret words you found? <laughs> Um, let's see, uh, 35 millimeter Fuji film stock, 24 millimeter anamorphic lens, uh, analog, uh, warm vintage tone, chromatic aberration, halation, uh, things that are like, uh, I guess words to describe literal film and to see what's in the, the training data, basically. That's interesting. So it's basically like you're, you're sort of giving it the instructions that you might otherwise give to like a cinematographer or someone. Yeah, I'd say like, hey, let's shoot on film. Right. Um, That's but really I wouldn't say, hey, uh, DP, uh, give me halation chromatic aberration. Like, you know, they're just going to be like. Bitch. I had a bad case um, of halation chromatic aberration once, but I went to the doctor and it cleared right up. <laughs> oh, that's good. <laughs> Paul, I, I, I just have a very basic nuts and bolts question, which is like you type in a prompt into Sora, you fill it with all these magic words, you hit enter. How long does it actually take to get the video back? Is it instant? No, but it's faster than you would think it is. How how long are we talking here? I heard from someone else that it's like like 10 or 15 minutes usually between when you put in the prompt and when it gives back the video. Is that consistent with your experience? Roughly, yeah. It just depends on the, the, the setting. So are you at 720p, 1080, uh, sh like the shot duration? But to do a really simple, you know, like shot of just a ball on the ground that's 15 seconds long will take just as much rendering time as doing like a crazy golden record hurtling through space and exploding and all this stuff. So that's actually really fascinating is what it does to render time. So having used this for a while now, are you thinking about this like, oh yeah, this is definitely a tool that I want in my arsenal going forward as I continue to make films, I can just sort of see a lot of applications for this, or is it sort of more in the, I could take it or leave it zone? I would definitely keep using this, but this is supplemental. This is not replacing by any means. Um, this is like a much better alternative to stock footage B-roll. And yeah, again, allows you to discover paths you maybe wouldn't have gone down. Um, but yes, I, I, I still think if you still want control and you want nuance and you want you know pacing, um, you're going to have to use the regular tools. And I, I still find it to be more gratifying to do things the traditional way, but damn, it gives you some really crazy stuff that is outside of the box. And I think the outside of the box stuff is the most exciting. Right. When the demos of Sora went online and people actually started to see some of the footage that was emerging from this system, um, there were a lot of people, especially in Hollywood who really had sort of a panic about it. Um, Tyler Perry, the, the famous director, yeah. um, said in an interview with The Hollywood Reporter that he 
was basically bowled over by some of this uh, this footage and that he was actually planning to put on hold in a planned expansion of his studio because he was just like, I don't know what what I need right now, <laughs> you know, if I can yeah. just sit in my office and create, uh, you know, amazing footage using this AI tool, um, you know, why do I need to go through the, you know, hassle of building out an expensive studio? So do you think those people who saw this and freaked out are overreacting? Is it the case that the sort of the closer you get to this technology, the less impressive it is? Or sort of what do you make of some of the responses that have come out about this tool? Yeah, sure. I feel like the more you use these tools, the less afraid you are of them because you do understand their limitations and you understand their place for them and you understand what separates this from using other traditional tools, BFX or, or in camera or actors. I think what Tyler Perry is saying is somewhat harmful and sending the wrong message to people that are at the top, at the studio level that uh, are the gatekeepers, the ones that have the money um, to say, hey guys, let's not spend our money. And it's, it's an incredibly capitalistic way of thinking. So so it's not, it's not that you think he's wrong necessarily about the potential of the technology to displace labor in filmmaking. It's that, you know, basically this is, this is sort of someone saying the quiet part out loud, like saying we, we might not want to spend all this money on humans. I think it's both too. I mean, he hadn't, even tested Sora at the time. I don't know if he has it now, but um, yeah, he hadn't played with the tool. And so I think he had the wrong interpretation of, of Sora being this kind of replacing everything. It'll create certain efficiencies for sure. But they're all the people, all the people on Twitter that love to tweet the line, RIP Hollywood, I really encourage them to go and actually watch a movie. Um, like seriously, don't watch a movie trailer, go watch a a real movie and see how much nuance and and detail and micro decisions that are made at every, you know, split second of a film from, from an actor's choice to, to the aesthetic and everything. Um, so that movies are incredibly complicated. Let me ask you about it a a different way. You know, earlier in the episode, uh, we were talking about the fact that uh, for a while I put AI generated images into my newsletter and my readers Mm. ultimately just kind of revolted against it. Like I got a lot of feedback just being like, we hate this. You're you're using uh, images that were trained on uh, copyrighted material. You're taking away money from from human illustrators. Um, I imagine you know that that you you might have gotten some some similar feedback, or you can at least imagine getting that feedback. How do you sure. think about th- those questions? Sure. Uh, well, can I ask what yeah. what was your illustration budget for uh, per year I, for your well, newsletter? Well, so that's the thing. I wasn't. I, I you know, I mean, I I, um, I had access to some uh, some image libraries like Getty Images, uh, sure. you know, all, all of that stuff. You know, in, in all those cases, a, a human being was was paid for their labor, right? So that's what I had been using. But I was not commissioning standalone illustrations for for my pieces. Exactly. Yeah. I think that's what people are missing is that um, we are creating content now that simply wouldn't have existed before. Um, sure, there can be you know studio, greedy studio heads at the top that will try to find ways to like cut the bottom line and um, and increase their margins. But the, for the most part, the people that are using these things are making things that that just wouldn't have existed. It's you see musicians um, notoriously have zero budget. Uh, sometimes they post like a, an AI g- generated image on Instagram, and then people are like, "Oh no, not you! You you use AI too?" Well, like, "Oh my God, cancel, unsubscribe!" And it's just like, but they wouldn't have posted anything that day if they didn't have the AI image. So it's it's kind of like creating, it's like opening up a new channel and. I mean, yes, there's like sensitivity around like and a black box of what's being trained on, but the reality is we can't like close Pandora's box. So we, like technology is relentless and, and we have to just kind of adapt to using these things. The way I, I feel like the narrative needs to be kind of steered is that 99% of scripts in Hollywood get rejected. Um, and then even of the 1% that get um, bought, um, only about half of those go into production. And so I think this will open up the opportunity for people with these ambitious and bold ideas to resurrect projects that that wouldn't have existed. I'm even going back to some music video concepts that I've pitched in the past 
that just like weren't going to work for the budget. Um, yeah. And I'm like, oh, I wonder how Sora does that. So one of the things I posted on the on the blog or on the OpenAI blog was this person covered in disco uh, ball mirrored glass pieces. One was like a kind of a visual effects test, like how well does it ref uh, do reflections, refractions, and caustics, and because I wanted to do this music video years ago with like uh, people covered in disco ball pieces, but it was just like VF VFX wise, it was way too expensive and we didn't really know how to do it. Um, makeup costume wise, it was like not either not going to look good or it was going to take too much time. And so we just didn't do the idea. And so then I did all these disco ball people um, and it handled it really well. And it was like really, that was actually somewhat satisfying. So Sora did, a, like, did something that you had tried doing a more conventional way without AI and doesn't... actually did pretty well. Yes. Wow. Yes, it did. It did very well. Uh, the, I was, that was the, the, some of the first tests I did was some of these things that are difficult to do, uh, you know, s simulations of fabric or water, fire, gold, um, and disco ball people. Yeah. So it, yeah, that, that was a shocking moment. But yeah, this resurrection of, of ideas, I think, is, is important because people don't really realize how much dies in the creative process. Yeah. Right. I have seen some backlash pointed at you and other filmmakers who have been experimenting with these tools, um, basically accusing OpenAI of artist washing, of you know basically using mm. artists to sort of uh, you know, test out these tools to show all the cool and creative uses for them while actually sort of negotiating behind the scenes to uh, to replace a bunch of labor or to to use these tools that many artists feel have been sort of trained on uh, on their work or, or work of their colleagues without permission. So I wonder uh. if you could just speak to that, th this idea of open AI sort of, uh, you know, using artists and, 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 you know, filmmakers to try to convince a skeptical public that all this right. stuff is just going to be good and it's going to enhance creativity and that it's not going to replace anyone's job um, while actually having a very different strategy behind the scenes. I mean, I think that is a very fascinating point and I it's something I kind of grapple with all the time because I I again I still love to do the traditional way and I still love to employ people and then but then the other side of me is like playing with all this new tech and um I'm like am I just some sort of pawn in this like great master plan of of AGI <laughs> but it's like what is the the opposite of this is you don't want artists involved in the research process I feel like including artists, if you're developing things that are that is visual technology, including artists in the process is, is critical because otherwise you're just kind of in this this bubble um, and, and you don't really understand like what the purpose is of your research. One question that comes to mind for me, Paul, is what are you working on next with this thing? Can you give us a, a preview of what else you think you can do with uh, Sora? Yeah. I mean, so I will say everything has to be kind of run through open AI in order to make it to the public. They are being very kind of selective with what they show. They don't want to kind of inundate people. They're being careful with how much is, is released. Uh, but I have, my brain has been spiraling. I've been working on a short film. I'm working on a music video. I don't know if that's like breaking news or not. No, that's that, breaking news. That's breaking news. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So that, that will, I, I can't say who or when or what, but, um, but so let's I just say Beyonce does have a new record out and a lot of people are listening to it. <laughs> potentially, yeah. yes. Yeah. That and then this Golden Record project potentially is, is bigger. But I'm also, I'm, I'm still exploring other routes and I, I, I don't see Sora as this, um, oh, I'm only going to focus on this tool to get everything out of my head. It's just a, it's a supplemental thing. But it's it's been very liberating. I'll say that. All right, Paul, we got to run. Um, All right, thank well, you so thank much. You really so great much, to talk Kevin to you. Thank Casey. You, Paul. Yeah, appreciate it. This you guys are great. awesome. All this right. is great. Right. Take care. Very Take care. Thanks a lot. All right, sure. awesome. Send us All your right. Sora login. Thanks. <laughs> okay. <laughs> hey, that's the end of this clip. If you liked what you saw, head on over to our page and subscribe, and you can get the full podcast. We do a show like this almost every week on tech and the future. Head on over there now and subscribe.